to get started. Let's take a breath together. Let's get ourselves in sync here. <sighs> so this month we've been looking at the thing itself with our first talk, Wonder, Wonder Everywhere, because that's what it is. We looked at the way it works by Embrace the Now. We looked at what it does last week by Question Everything. <laughs> and this morning, we're looking at how to use it, also known as Prove It. Possibly not in the way you have used that phrase in the past. <laughs> we, we typically use that phrase, Prove It, when someone else is saying something to us, and we're like, Prove it. That's not the kind of prove it we're talking about this morning. So remember, our overall theme this year is recognizing that spiritual living does not happen just in your meditation chair. Doesn't happen just here. Doesn't just happen in your prayer time. Spiritual living literally happens when we live spiritually from spiritual principle and that really is the context of proving it that we're talking about this morning so how does one get to Carnegie Hall we've all heard that right practice 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 and how does one demonstrate principle according to Ernest Holmes we demonstrate principle by proving it so how do we live spiritually by practicing the demonstration of spiritual principle? <laughs> by literally practicing, proving what we teach on a daily basis. I want to share with you a story. We're not that far away from New Year's, right? And a Pretty common practice for us humans, at least in the United States of America, is New Year's resolutions, right? So Johnny made a New Year resolution that he was going to join a gym and get healthy. And so he did. He joined the gym. And as part of his membership, he got three personal training sessions. And so he went with the first time and he met with the personal trainer and his personal trainer worked with him to create a plan to accomplish the things that Johnny said he wanted to accomplish. Gave him a couple of exercises to start with. And their session ended. So about a month later, Johnny came back for his second session. And his trainer gave him some more exercises to work on, recommended some classes that might help him achieve his goals, and recommended some dietary changes that he might want to consider. A month later, Johnny came back for his third session. And by now, Johnny's pretty discontent. He's complaining that, you know, I paid all this money and I've met with you twice and I am not getting any results, dude. What's up? So the trainer thought for a minute and then he asked Johnny a couple of questions. He asked Johnny, what classes have you taken? Johnny thought for a minute. He said, I haven't taken any. And he asked him what dietary changes he'd made. And he said, none. And then he asked him, so out of all of the exercises that I gave you, which ones do you find work for you the best? And Johnny looked really perplexed. And he's like, wait, you mean I'm actually supposed to do them? <laughs> right? Now, we can all laugh at that. But how much of our spiritual journey is exactly the same as Johnny's thing at the gym? My job, my honor, my privilege, you know, being a minister is kind of like being a spiritual personal trainer. Right? I give you ideas to follow. I give you exercises to try. I suggest spiritual dietary changes. Did you know that the word 
diet actually comes from the Greek diete, which literally means way of being. It has nothing to do with food. It has to do with how we be in life, how we are living our life. And I can give you all of those things, but what I can't do is make you use them. I can't be at your house and make you sit down and meditate. I can't make you open a book and study. And even if I could, I can't make you learn. <laughs> I can't make you be open to doing anything you don't want to do. And that's the beauty of what we teach. You are the only thinker in your mind. You are the sole authority of your experience. And here comes the R word. You are responsible for what you experience in life. You are responsible for how you experience life. Nobody else is. It's all too easy to blame one another. So on this idea of being a personal trainer in the spiritual realm. Personal training, you have to study anatomy and physiology. So what's the anatomy and physiology of spiritual practice? The anatomy is the science of studies of the structure of the body. That's what anatomy is. So spiritually speaking, there is no structure in the infinite body. So it is really the study of unformed substance. Now that takes our, our brains a minute to wrap around because we live in a physical realm and our orientation is to form. But to really study spiritual anatomy, we have to go beyond the form, metaphysical, beyond the physical, right? That's what metaphysics is. The physiology, physiology is the study of function and can be investigated at the levels of cells, tissues, organs, and the whole body. So if we translate that to spiritual physiology, we're really talking about the study of the creative process, that thoughts become things, right? Right? So, in this, I'm holding this up for the folks online. Let me, it's like driving a wheel. Wee! <laughs> so, this is our teaching symbol, right? And we have one on the wall in here, but it, the folks online can't see that. So, we have this one upstairs. This top part represents mind that unformed substance this middle section quite literally represents the activity of mind we refer to it as law we refer to it as soul but it's the impartial receiver of the ideas of mind and then this bottom level is manifest form it's this lectern, it's my computer, it's me, it's you. And this little symbol quite literally came about as Ernest Holmes was teaching. And it wasn't intentional at all. He had the three levels and what he was showing was thought comes from here, down here. And then we see the form and we have new thoughts about the form, and those new thoughts are creative, and the loop continues. It's really that simple. But we complicate it. Well, why do we complicate it? Well, for one, it's not necessarily a fun thing to recognize that we're always proving something. <laughs> See, we, we like to think of this proof as I can take time off and then come back and when I have a new idea that I really like, I can be about the business of proving that. Well, here's the reality. We are always practicing. We are always proving whatever we hold in consciousness. 
There is no way around it. The creative process has no off switch. But we can choose how we use it. And we choose that by being aware. Right? So what's happening when in our spiritual gym exercises, we're not getting the results that we think we should be getting, right? Because we all have them, right? It's like I'm praying and I'm treating and I'm meditating and I'm journaling and I'm not getting what I want. Well, Ernest Holmes says that this is not a teaching where you can have everything you want, that that's a misunderstanding, that what we get is what we have the consciousness to create. That's very different than what I want, right? Because what's operating in consciousness are those deeply held beliefs, the ones that oftentimes we're not even aware of. Practitioners go through six prerequisite classes, and then two years of study, and then sit before a licensing panel to learn and prepare themselves to actually help us uncover our hidden beliefs. There's a reason we call them hidden beliefs, because we don't know they're there. <laughs> Right? Doesn't make them bad, doesn't make us bad. It just means we have a subconscious that holds beliefs that are in the collective consciousness. There are beliefs in our subconscious that came about generations ago. Doesn't mean they're not operating in there. It just means we're not aware that they're operating in there. And one of those deep, deeply held beliefs that will crop up from time to time, even in those of us that practice diligently, is this idea way back in there that this stuff doesn't even work. Right? It's a nice idea, but it really doesn't work. Science of mind. The 1938 edition, page 52, paragraph 5, says this. Hence, it follows that if we believe that it will not work, it really works by appearing to not work. <laughs> when we believe that it cannot and will not, then according to principle, it does not. But when it does not, it still does. <laughs> Only it does according to our belief that it will not. This is our own punishment through the law of cause and effect. We do not enter in because of our doubts and fears. It is not a punishment imposed upon us by the Spirit of God, but an authentic result of failing constructively to use the law of God. That's like the best reference to how I'm responsible that I can come up with. As I think, so I am. So what do we do? I'm going to share this other quote. Ten ideas. That make a difference. 1966, Ernest Holmes. Page 46, paragraph 4. Without faith and acceptance, it is impossible for us to change our life. This does not mean faith in our personality. That's where we get confused when we're trying to change things. It's not faith in our personality, our faith in our personal power, but faith in life itself. That unformed substance. Faith by definition. Faith is the belief. Faith is the substance of the belief of things not seen. It's the belief in the substance. 
He goes on, faith in oneself alone is not enough to meet the issues of life. Many have tried it, but it has never proved successful. There is, no, there is something about our very nature that demands a constant communication with the invisible. Every person, whether or not they know it or believe it, is some part of divine life. Too often, we may hypnotize ourselves into believing that we are incomplete. We are imperfect. We are separate and isolated. And we identify ourselves with the fantastic pictures of our morbid dream. <laughs> Another way to say that is we get stuck in the physical realm. We get stuck in condition rather than in the truth of the unformed reality that is the essence of all form. So what do we do? Well, we got a couple of options. One is Socratic thinking. Okay. Socrates said that all knowledge exists within the student and just needs to be drawn out through skillful questioning. Sometimes we're so busy looking for the answers, we don't ask questions that will lead us to the answers that are already present within us. Another method is the scientific method, observation. And from that observation, we question. And then we research the topic. And then we form a hypothesis of what we think is going on. And this is where proving it, this is where spiritual practice comes in. Test your hypothesis with experiment. Test it. And then analyze. Well, what is it that we're analyzing? You're analyzing what's showing up in your life. Does it match your hypothesis? If it doesn't, then the conclusion has to be something is operating in the subconscious that is out of your awareness that has to be surfaced in order for you to have a new thought. I suggest... Starting with the scientific method. And when you get to that place where you're analyzing the results and they don't match up, go to the Socratic questioning. What thought is showing up as this experience? It's really that simple. But it isn't always fun because... <laughs> We just want the payoff. If we're being really honest, right? I want to have the thought. I want the words to come out of my mouth. And I just want it to show up. Thank you very much. As if the divine is some celestial vending machine. <laughs> right? We have to begin to be honest about what's operating in order to get clarity about What's really operating? The good news is it isn't hard to decide. It isn't hard to know what's operating. Look at your life. Just look at your life. All the evidence is right there. Okay. So in conclusion, this is what Ernest Holmes says in Science of Mind on page 423. In conclusion, the world needs a spiritual conviction followed by spiritual experience. I would rather see a student of this science prove its principles <clears throat> than to have them repeat all the words of wisdom that have ever been uttered. If you can't prove it in your life, how do you know it's true? How do you know? And if you aren't proving it, then I submit to you that through 
that analysis of scientific method and Socratic questioning that you in fact do not believe it's true because if you did, it would show up. Remember that other quote? If I don't believe it works, it works by not working. <laughs> right? Whatever you deeply believe, the unquestioned beliefs are what show up in your life, and those are the things we get to change. We get to change. You don't have to, but you get to. Right? I want to wrap up with this. 12-step <laughs> recovery now, many of you will instantly, instantly, the thought that just came into your head is, I don't have that problem. <laughs> you instantly dismiss it because you're not a member of 12-step recovery and you don't see yourself there. Good. But the 12 steps have something to offer everybody because it's a program of practice. It is a program of self-examination Self-responsibility and proving metaphysical principles that work to change people's lives. And I submit to you that if a bunch of drunks and junkies can sit together and figure all this out and actually change their lives, the rest of us got no excuse. I qualify on all counts personally. It works because people practice. They live the steps on a daily basis. And so I invite you to figure out what system of spiritual recovery will work for you. Whether it's 12 steps, 12 minutes, 12 breaths, 34 breaths. Doesn't matter what practice will work for you. The best practice that you'll ever have is the one you will do. <laughs> What's the best diet? The one you will follow. It's that simple. And it gets to be individualized for you. So your homework this week, not a bunch of questions. Just practice. So I invite you to look at Somebody, and if you're online, just if you got somebody there, look at them. If not, say it to the camera. I commit to practice this week. <laughs> there we go. Let's take this into prayer. And so I know. That this one divine life is living itself. That it is the essence of my physical being. That is expressing and unfolding its life as this thing I call my life. I know that what is true of me is true of all life. And so I know that all life is the divine unfolding. Regardless of appearance. Beyond the physical. The divine is unfolding itself. And so I speak my word claiming and affirming a recommitment to the divine yes within me to practice, to evaluate, to ask the questions that reveal that higher, clearer thought that becomes the experience of my life. In deep, deep gratitude, I let it go. I let it be, and so it is. Hmm. Ah.